This series of author interviews is brought to you by Leshenault Press and the Book Reality Experience, turning writers' dreams into book realities. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another author interview in the Book Realities series. And today we're joined by Murray Hall, author of Walk a War in My Shoes. G'day, Murray. How are you? That's fantastic. Thank you. Thanks for having me on board. No worries. Um, so for people that don't know about Murray Hall or indeed Walk a War in My Shoes, who are you? Where are you from? And where do you call home? And where are you talking to us? Um, okay, so right at the moment, I'm sitting in my family lounge room in the southeastern Perth suburb of Rowie Stone. It's up in the hills, and I'm surrounded by bush and, and a lot of wild animals and uh, native animals. And uh, this is where I operate from. I'm mostly retired, so uh, I'm very happy up here. Good work. Um, where were you born? Were you born in Perth, Western Australia? No, not at all. No, I was born and raised in Melbourne, um, but at about the age of 30, I found a better place to live. And uh, I've been in Perth ever since. Very good. Now, when I first met you, I'd asked you a little bit about yourself for the about the author feature in the back of your book. And you'd said to me that you used to ride bikes a bit. And then I found and discovered a little bit more about you. So do you want to tell people when you said that you used to ride bikes a bit, what you actually meant by it? Um, okay, but I need to probably shorten the story a little bit. Um, I started competitive cycling as a 12-year-old, and that's all I ever wanted to do. And I had a very successful career, career uh, initially on the track. And as I got older and slower, I turned to the road. So I had two cracks at, uh, at professional cycling. I was a professional for 16 years, and I retired from that level of the competition at age 35 after I won my last Australian track championship. So I had a very good run. And you represented Australia twice at the Commonwealth Games. Yeah, Commonwealth Games was good to me. I got a couple of silver medals at that. I represented Australia at the World Championships a few times. Um, and I the, the sport was very good to me. I raced in a lot of countries around the world. And, and um, you know, I, I had a good run and, and I'm still involved with the sport up to my neck as an uh, administrator. Um, so I stayed with the sport. Very good. So when you were riding bikes, did you want to be a writer as well? Or was this something that came later in the day? It's funny you should say that because I remember very distinctly as an 18 year old sitting with a couple of other blokes and I said, to them, I wouldn't mind writing a book one day. But it was sort of a in their eyes, it was a joke. They laughed at me. But they, there was a little seed set there, and I just had that thought and that desire, but it didn't progress. But I had that vision in my mind that one day that might just evolve. So it wasn't something that was in me or that I had studied for or that had been in the family. Uh, in, in the case where you and I are now connected, it just come very late in life, and when it come on, it's been full ball. So the book that we're talking about, Walk of War, My Shoes, um, in a nutshell, what, what's it about? It's a true World War I story. And um, again, to cut a long story short, uh, when my mother died, she, I was cleaning out her house and she had a, in the bottom of a big filing cabinet was a very large folder and it had all the original letters and documents that my great uncle had sent back. That's him behind me. Um, from the First World War. And uh, what I intended to do with all those documents was to make sure they finished up with the Australian War Memorial. But in doing so, those as I transcribed those letters for my benefit, the story that it told was too good to leave in the bottom of someone's drawer. And uh, that's how that progressed and, and the story grew from there. So he was fairly unique in World War I memoirs, so to speak, because we've got lots of memoirs written by generals and lots of memoirs written by the politicians, but this was a standard private soldier whose letters to and fro from home had been kept and documented. So did you just transcribe them sitting in your house in Perth, or did you decide to go and have a look at where he had been? Okay, so it started off like when I started to transcribe them word for word. I became really connected and interested in 
the thousands of different things that he may have mentioned. Um, so I become really fascinated with the research. So I started to research every possible thing that he might have mentioned. If he mentioned a town, I'd go, uh, I researched that town and why it was critically important for him to have mentioned that town in 1915, what that town looked like, etc. And that happened a thousand different times. And yes, I did travel. I travelled to all the major points listed in the book, two trips to Europe, um, to the, the, the battlegrounds there, uh, to where the story starts in Tasmania, where it moves on to Victoria, all those venues I went to. Um, I probably should mention that I lived in Belgium as a lot younger man as part of my cycling career, and I had been to his gravesite once when I was about 18 years of age, so I knew of him a very long time ago. Um, but that's how that all that process fell into place. So when you were looking up, researching his journey, and you ultimately called the book Walker Warren My Shoes, what was the most... Um, not harrowing, but most interesting thing that you found during all your research or the most surprising thing that you find? I think, to me, it was having my feet on the ground. It, you can look at a, at a wall map, at a mud map, at a trench map, an old historical map, or even Google Maps, and you get a rough idea of what's going on. But to physically walk the ground and to walk on the same patch of earth where this trench line was, where my great uncle was, because I've got the coordinates of where he stood that day, and to look around, and in Belgium now in France as well, a lot of those areas are still pristine. They're still open farmer's fields, so you can get your eyes on the ground exactly what was happening and where people were, where the high ground was, why that little rise in the ground was so critical that they had to lose thousands and thousands of men to climb that 20 or 30 metre rise in the ground. But to have your eyes on the ground, that made the difference to me. It put it put value into what I was writing about because I knew what was going on. So the other thing is, as an AMZAC um, memoir of World War One, this is Europe. So I should have said Belgium, France. Uh, this isn't Gallipoli, which is the more studied version of the Australian um, and New Zealand Army Corps story. So you followed him as he left Australia, he's moved into Egypt, and then he goes to southern France. Uh, what battlefields did he end up fighting on? He was up and down the Western Front, uh, France into Belgium, but a really short area, maybe 100, mil 100 kilometres down from Ypres, along that uh, north-south uh, uh, battle line. Um, he was seconded to one of the tunnelling companies there for about three months in the middle of his time. He was away for 18 months. Um, he was involved with the conflict for 18 months. Uh, so he bit, did a bit of time, but 99% uh, of it was spent in that 100 kilometre zone between Ipa and, and to the south. And when you said he was a tunneller, so he was operating as a tunneller in the underground mines underneath the battlefields where... You couldn't see your hand in front of you. They were listening to the, the German troops on the other side. Mm -hmm. And on occasion, if they heard them, they would very quickly um, build some explosive up against the wall, run away and detonate them. It must have been horrendous. Did he mention those in his letters home? Yes, he did. And, and, and I've managed to capture that, I hope, in the book. There's a couple of examples there. One was where he was deep underground as working as a listener. So he had the stethoscope thing on. And uh, he could hear the Germans talking. So they were separated by a little bit of clay. They're on one side. He's on the other side. And uh, you, you can't imagine the fear. I can't imagine the fear that would be in you working two, three hundred uh, metres underground, surrounded by uh, the opposition and, and, and your desire is to blow them up as well as them you. And you don't know when that's going to happen at any given time. Add into the fact you can't see, you've got a little candle light, um, and if the air is that ba bad, you don't have the candle light and you can hardly breathe anyway. You, the claustrophobia around that would be horrific. Can't imagine it. So he was, as well as tunnelling, he was also on the front line in the trenches. He would yeah. take part in trench raids and he was bombarded. So sadly, uh, he didn't make it home, did he? No, he didn't. No. So which battlefield did he finally see his last days on? Um, it's called 
the Battle of Brutsinda, uh, but other people would know that as the Battle of Passchendaele. It's the same day, the same event. Passchendaele is one kilometre away up the road, but it's specific to that absolute point, uh, place in, in, in uh, Belgium, it's called the Battle of Brutsinda. On the 4th of October this year, I'm sorry I get a little bit sidetracked, but on the 4th of October this year, the Australian War Memorial in Canberra, um, my soldier will be honoured at that last post ceremony on the 4th of October, which happens to coincide as the 105th anniversary of the Battle of Brutsinda. Um, and that for us and for the family is about the highest accolade this country can pay my soldier. So it all, it all gels in 105 years later. Very good. And what age was he when he fell? 22. Which is no age at all, really, is it? No, no. incredibly sad. So when you were over there and you'd researched the story and you came home, was there anything that turned up um, within the research once you were bringing it together that you found surprising? Or was there anything that you'd found that had been overlooked in the years between him passing away and the time when you were doing the research? He, he laid it out pretty well for me, um, but it was up to me to do all that research. And, and I should mention that the research and from the day I picked the uh, the letters up to the day you and I spoke first was five years. So the project wasn't a one minute turnaround job. It took five years. And most of that time was spent on research or travel um, to, to fill in those little intricate gaps. I'll make one example that um, in, his, in his letters, he said that uh, he was training to be a machine gunner. Now, I, I'm not ex-military. I wouldn't know the front end of a machine gun from the back of one. So I found that uh, the um, Fremantle War uh, um, Museum had a Vickers machine gun. So I took my iPad down there, pulled up a seat, and I was there all day YouTubing and Googling up everything that I could see with this uh, machine gun. So I walked out of there and could now, if we had one in the, in the lounge room here, I could lock and load it for him. We could put a few rounds out the window. But that point being that I'd spent all day and probably two or three days after that either side to study what turned out to be one and a half lines in the book. But that's what you got to do. You need to be able to build a story and you need to know what you are writing about. So I love the research part of it. Excellent. And during your research, you found out that he'd been awarded medals, but they'd actually never turned up, yeah? That was a fantastic add-on to the story. So halfway through the book, it occurred to me one day that the family, and we're pretty close, had never seen his medals. We had my grandfather's medals, his brother, who and my grandfather's over there, um, we had my grandfather's medals because they hung in my father's house on the lounge room like they are here now. But nobody had ever seen Uncle Ernest's medals. So I looked up his personnel file, and in the back of the personnel file on the last page is uh, dedicated to the medals that he was entitled to and a, a date and a, an inscription that they'd been sent out to the family farm in 1921. But when I wrote, I wrote to the Australian government, I said, I don't think these medals have ever been in the family's hands. And they wrote back and they said, you are correct. Because if you have a close look at it and if you knew what you were looking for, they've never been signed off as being received. So we confirmed that those medals were not in your hands. And if you wish to apply for them, and included in that email was a half filled out stat deck in my name, it was a pretty subtle hint. If you apply for them, we'll consider sending them out to you. Six weeks later, those medals, the original ones behind my head, um, turned up in the uh, local post office, and now they sit proudly in my lounge room. Fantastic. So what did the rest of the family think about the book? Because originally you were only going to get 20 or 25 copies printed so that the family could be aware of their uncle Ernest. What do the rest of the family think about it? It's been a magnificent journey for the greater family because relatives have come out of the woodwork because they've either been told or they've found out that they're connected, that we're connected, um, then through uh, ancestry, etc. And some of the history things I needed to know, I spoke to a lot of people. So the family has exploded. Um, and as I said before about this Australian War Memorial uh, function on the 4th of October, we intend to have a, um, a, a celebration of his life in a hotel that we've got booked there after. And there's, uh, there's relatives coming out of the woodwork to be there on that night. So that's a fantastic add-on too. 
Now, of course, you changed your plans. You didn't just get 20 to 25 copies printed for the family. You decided to publish it and make it available commercially. Um, how did how has that worked out for you? And what have you been doing in support of getting the wider message out about um, your Uncle Ernest and indeed Walk of War in My Shoes? It was the best thing I ever did, guided by yourself. And uh, I can say, honestly, the greatest thrill I ever got of writing that book was the day that the courier driver came to my front door and handed me the first edition, first copy of that book. And anyone that's ever been in that boat will know that that will bring tears to your eyes. Um, So it's the best thing I've ever done. Uh, But I'm a bit proactive in how I promote the book and promote myself. I'm not frightened to get out there and, 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 and tell the story. I love to tell the story. And I, I still now do uh, on a regular basis, maybe once a fortnight, once every three weeks, I'm either in an RSL, a library, a U3A conference or um, a retiree group, uh, whatever I can get my hands on. And a lot of those ones I just mentioned are all around the same age de- demographic, which means that they are very closely associated with World War One and our ANZACs. There are so many people still connected with that subject. Because you're not only talking to them about the story of your Uncle Ernest and how the Anzacs um, fared in World War One, but you're also talking about uh, family heritage research. You're also talking about how you actually write a story like that, battlefield tours, et cetera. So it's a multifunctional talk that you're giving, yeah? Absolutely. And when I do open up that, that presentation, there's four points that I try to bring to the people. It's about... Uh, uh, the family history, how you do that research and, and 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 how well Australia is adapt to go and find those records. The military records overlap that and they are absolutely superb. There is nothing you cannot find unless it's been destroyed in World War One is now uh, recorded and you can go and lay your hands on it. It's very easy if you know how to do it. Um, uh, how to take a manuscript to print because I like to tell that story. I like to tell that part of how... I got to the end of the what I'd written the book and, and thought to myself, that's that the job's done. What do I do now? And that's a really important question. That a lot of people must ask themselves, what do you do when you're finished? When the manuscript's finished, who who do you ring? What what phone number do you ring? And it's a minefield. It's an absolute nightmare if you have no idea what you're doing. So that's a really good story that I can say I progressed this. It wasn't difficult. It wasn't, didn't lose too much sleep over it. It was a magnificent journey to be able to bring that book to the time that someone brings it to your front door. So, Fantastic. Now, you also had it turned into an audio book, and weirdly, so we should say Ernest came from a little place in near Melbourne, which was called... Beach Forest. And that's within an area which is fairly... Um, specific to that um, southwest of Victoria. But when you were getting your book turned into an audio book, you decided to use an Australian voice actor who actually lives in America, but it turned out to be a bit more coincidental than that, didn't it? That was an unbelievable story there. So uh, we uh, we put the book out to market or the in, uh, expressions of interest and we got 20 uh, people came back and I think 10 submitted. We had to had to uh, chop that down to four, four more put through. And we had this one bloke on the radar that had a very strong, had a terrific ac- Australian accent. And uh, the only apprehension that I had with him from day one was his age. I wasn't sure whether when people listen to the book, whether they listen to a 23-year-old or whether they listen to a bloke a few years younger than me telling the story. But this guy stuck with me and because he could do emotion and he could do character. And so ultimately he was the man. So we sent him uh, the contract and the, uh, and the manuscript and the day later he came back and said, he said a couple of things. He said that uh, I have as much, he's read a fair bit of the manuscript overnight. He said, I have as much respect as the Anzacs as anybody else walking around here. I'm doing this book because of my passion and these are my people. He was born, bred in Colac, 30 kilometres away from Beach Forest. He knew that area. And his parents, as we discussed with him before we actually got into the full recording, his parents would have known Ernest family 
Ernest Perrins because of the size of the area. Yeah. And to pluck him from a cast of 20 odd voice actors, but especially when he lives in uh, North Carolina in America, yeah. Um, to find that he was within 30 kilometers of the story's source was was pretty spectacular. You couldn't have written that script. It was impossible. And, and the guy was fantastic. And uh, and if you ever get, if anyone that's listening to this, to this gets the opportunity, please just even click on the on the link that uh, does the, sh- the very short intro that he does. And it, it'll, it'll get you in. He does a magnificent job. And we're going to use part of his introduction as a reading on the channel as well, so people can listen to it there and get a taster for it. Um, Listen, Murray, when you're not writing now um, and you're not administrating cycling, what's what's the plans next? What's next for Murray Hall? Um, I've got a couple of things on my plate. Uh, There is a second book that is being worked on and is about to be introduced to you. Um, It's about as far removed from walk a war in my shoes as you'll ever get but we we can come back to that later if we want um i have a passion for um our native animals and i've always wanted to be a home carer so i work one day a week um at a local at uh, darling range animal shelter and i specifically look after the kangaroos and I love that. And um, last week, uh, the vets come up here to check out the house and what I had to offer here because I'm on a bit of a property. And uh, I'm progressing to be a home carer, and that's what I would really like to do. So you're going to be the adopted parent of a little Jewy and look yeah. after kangaroos at home? Well, you never get one. You get two. They bring them in in pairs, and you get a pair of them. You get twins. Fantastic. Well done, yeah. you. Um, and we've also mentioned that you've um, written the second book, which is going to go into a bit of a rewrite and a bit of an edit. Uh, what's the working title of that? The manuscript title is called um, Fear and Loathing in Broom. But I'm thinking that we and I might change that. But anyway, that's that's where those manuscripts is. And for people that don't know, Broom's a town, a pearl fishing town up in the north. Well, it was established as a pearl fishing town up in the northwest of Western Australia. So it's a it's a bit far flung from uh, the centres of Sydney and Melbourne. It's about it, the loose story is that uh, it's based on a true story about. Uh, uh, in the early to mid '90s, there was a lot of skullduggery up there, and some characters there that uh, the story can now be told. Good stuff. Well, hopefully, we'll change all the names to protect ourselves from lawsuits. So Correct. Be good. Correct. Um, thanks very much, Mel. It's really been appreciated that you've taken the time out to do this. Um, if you're up for it, do you fancy fifteen quick fire questions just to end things off? Yeah, we'll have a crack at it. Happy days. No, these are meant to be quick fire, so here we go. Yep. Ready? Murray Hall. What is your favourite book? Walk of War in My Shoes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your least favourite book? I don't have one. What turns you on? Cold beer and a hot day. Good work. What turns you off? Warm beer. <laughs> <laughs> summer or winter? Oh, summer. I'm a summer man. I hate the winter. On a completely free day to do anything you want, who do you spend it with? I enjoy my own company. Good work. Mountains or oceans? Oceans. Even though I know you do mountain bike riding. Okay. So can I change that? Mountains. (laughs) What is your favourite movie? One I saw two weeks ago, Elvis. Okay. Um, One song to listen to for the rest of your life? I did it my way. Who makes you laugh the most? My animals. What smell do you love? I have uh, cooking. I have some two very good chefs here. What smell do you hate? Cleaning the animal pens. (laughs) Other than the professions that you've done, what would you like to have attempted? In another life, I would love to have been a helicopter pilot. Okay. What profession would you not like to do? Um, Probably something in community service, like uh, child welfare or nursing or something like that. I couldn't do that. 
And if heaven exists, when Murray Hall finally arrives there, what's God going to say to you? The beer tent's out of there. <laughs> Good work. Excellent stuff. Hey, listen, Murray, thanks very much for your time, man. Pleasure talking to you. Good on you. Thanks, Ian. All the best. Cheers, man. Hi, thanks for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please give it a like and subscribe to our channel for more readings and author interviews. And don't forget to hit that button to be notified every time we post new content.